You are listening to the Motherhood Unstress Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am so glad that you're here, as always, and I am truly excited to share the work of my guest with you this week. I think it's definitely going to help you find more balance in your life and to look at things differently and to be able to solve problems in in a way that we often overlook. So I think that that's always interesting, and I know already that a conversation like this is going to help so many people, and that's exciting. So I'm speaking this week with University of Virginia professor Lydie Klotz, and he's discussing his new book, Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less, which explores the concept of subtraction as an effective yet often overlooked problem-solving strategy. Lydie was a former professional soccer player. He now studies how to transform things from how they are to how we want them to be. And he's written for a number of prominent publications, including the Washington Post, the Globe and Mail, and the Behavioral Scientist. Now, again, this is a very down-to-earth conversation. Everything that's very high science, um, Lydie's able to discuss in plain terms for all of us uh, to understand and to implement into our own lives. So I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and please share out on social media and tag us at Motherhood Unstressed. Enjoy the episode with Professor Lydie Klotz. Well, hello, Professor Klotz. Welcome to the show. I am so glad that you're here. Thanks, Liz. I'm glad to be here, too. Absolutely. So, I mean, right out the gate, my question has to be, how does a professional soccer player get into the wild world of the science of less? Oh, man. Um, I guess I needed to make more money than $2,000 a month, which is what I was making (laughs) when I was a professional (laughs) soccer player. Uh, So I had to think about what am I going to do with my life uh, beyond this. And I mean, I've always been interested in um, like climate and sustainability issues. And so and my background was in engineering. Um, And so I kind of took that, started looking at how these things that I care about merge together. And, you know, there's just this fundamental problem of we can't just do more and more and more and more and, and solve some of these most important issues that our society is, is facing. So, I mean, that's, that happened over 15 years, but it's a, uh, that's the short story of how it happened. I love it. And how did your, your physical training, you know, having coaches, having, being accountable to teammates, how did that prepare you for the rigors of academia, you know, e- egos included and all of that? What, what fundamentals did you have in place that made you, you know, able to take on that next level, that higher level that paid more than 2000 a month? <laughs> um, I think, yeah, it's, it's just totally invaluable for number. So talking about individual performance, I guess we'll start there. But when you're playing a sport and trying to do it at the, the highest level possible, you start thinking about everything, right? Like how you spend your time, how, how, what you eat impacts your performance after you eat, how, you know, how, how much sleep you get impacts your performance the next day. And so you're just constantly trying to to tweak these things about your life and seeing how they affect the outcomes that you care about. And, you know, I don't, my livelihood doesn't depend on how fast I can run or how well I can play with a ball anymore, but it does depend on how well my brain works and, and all of these same, uh, same skills are relevant. And so, I mean, I think when I have a mental block or, so I'll give you an, uh, more concrete examples. Like for me, it's just fundamental to think, okay, well, after I wake up and I just had a workout this morning and that's when I will schedule the podcast. Cause that's when I'll be, have the most like mental aptitude and I'll be most interesting for the listeners. And, um, so, I mean, I think that's something that follows directly from, from sports. So that's some of the individual stuff. And then some of the, the team stuff. I mean, I think, the if you've played on real teams and done like real competition it makes the competition in academia seem kind of trivial right it's like what are we <laughs> fighting about like there's 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 no reason we can't all be successful we're all working on different stuff we're all trying to contribute to knowledge and share knowledge and it, you know the fact that the guy one office over from me or the woman one office over from me is doing great doesn't mean that i can't also do great um so i think it's really helped with that kind of collaboration and, um, you know, learning that the best things and, and the most 
enjoyable things, quite frankly, happen when you're, you know, working really hard with a group of other people, which is something that happens in academia as well as in soccer. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I love that you said that. I mean, we were talking about earlier how I have two boys and you have children. Yeah. And it's like that that sports element really does change the brain and change the the attitude of the child early, early on so that they can be successful in life and, and effectively work with others from a place of confidence versus um, competition. It's still competitive, but what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a great, uh, my, my buddy, Ben, who's, he's in the book, uh, because he's a collaborator on the research, but he, um, he sent me a text about his, his son who's been playing soccer and his son said to him, Hey, I I crossed the line. (laughs) And he, and his son was meaning like, he like flipped the switch. And, And like you said, it's this sports is this really controlled environment that shows you if you like work at something, you can see that you're getting better. Right. And so like his son had played soccer with us a couple times, with the grownups and then went back to his kids team and realized that he could like dribble a little bit more and shoot. And it's like, you know, he's probably not going to be a professional soccer player, but that's a useful life skill to learn that like, Hey, if you work at something, (laughs) you get better. And so I think that's amazing. The amazing thing with sports. And like you said, it's, you know, you don't want to get it to where it's so competitive. I'll stay with a soccer example. I mean, Christian Pulisic, he's the best, arguably the best player that America has ever produced and his like there's some really great articles online about how he was brought up with soccer and his parents were like just after the game take him out to ice cream (laughs) and um so I mean that that competition it doesn't help with the being overly demanding as parents doesn't help with creating professional soccer players and it obviously doesn't help with creating you know, kids who are going to be successful in the world after, after they're done playing soccer. Mm, I love that. I love that. And, and to transition more to the work that you're doing now, you're out with a new book called Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less. How, how did that book come about? And why do you feel like now is the perfect time for a book like this to come into the world? Like I said, I, I've long been interested in these sustainability issues and this, you know, this kind of decoupling progress from more. Um, and but the book really builds on new research that we did. And that's what makes it, I think, the most timely. And so, I mean, long story short, what we found was that we systematically overlook subtraction as a way to make things better. Um, so whether we're trying to improve our schedule, whether we're trying to improve a piece of writing, whether we're trying to, um, make a Lego structure, I mean, these are all things that we tested in experiments. Our first instinct is to think, Hey, what can I add to this to make it better? Which isn't necessarily a problem, but the problem comes when you add and move on without even thinking of subtracting in the first place. And so I think that's what makes it really timely is the book came out at the same time as that research, which was on the cover of nature, which has never happened to me before and will never happen again. I mean, that's like the most prestigious academic (laughs) journal uh, and has gotten amazing reception in academia. But I think the book is like, hey, this is super important or super useful for people. So how can I do my uh, do my job kind of sharing knowledge in this case and, and get it out there in a way that people can understand it and that people can use it? So that's um, that's the timeliness argument for the book. Yeah. Do you feel like it was kind of like divine almost in a way, like everything that you've been working for, everything that you care about, um, especially when it comes to architecture and climate change, do you feel like it was almost like a natural push that this needed to co- to happen now? I mean, it's odd how things come into place. Yeah. I mean, it was certainly divine that the paper came out a week before the, um, before the book. I mean, so like whatever you believe in, whether it's like divine or fate or just like this ridiculous coincidence that the timing of those two things happened like that. Um, also that like all of the ideas and kind of came together at that time. Um, so I don't know. I also, but I also think that it's like when you're sharing information, you're just like kind of sharing at a moment in time. Right. And your thinking evolves after that and before that. And, but it, it, it certainly was like, Hey, this is a moment where we have to share this. 
But going back to the premise of the book, why is it that and you've done numerous studies that humans tend to think that by adding to whatever a Lego set or designing a room or putting on, you know, certain items for an outfit, why do we think that adding is going to make things better and, and yeah. more efficient? Yeah, that's a quote I didn't put in the book by Coco Chanel. It's like, to, before you leave your house, remove one article of clothing. There you it's go. Like, there's so many of those quotes. And I think the quotes are um, the quotes are some of the best evidence that we overlook it, right? Because it's like, everybody's like, oh, that's a pithy Coco Chanel quote. Yeah. It's so memorable. And you don't need the reminder to, oh, before you leave the house, add a piece of clothing. That doesn't become like a viral quote. Um, so these, the fact that these reminders are so long lived and, um, you know, Lao Tzu to gain knowledge, add things every day to gain wisdom, subtract things every day. It's like, that's one of the oldest quotes in the world. Uh, and it's about subtracting to make things better. Um, so I think, you know, we talked about how, just cognitively in our thinking process, when we try to change something from how it is to how we want it to be, we we're, we think of adding first. So that's one reason. Um, and, but if you go back more to kind of evolutionary or, or cultural reasons, um, just acquiring things has been a good way to pass down our genes, right? Um, acquiring food, um, acquiring shelter, uh, and also... Um, Another one that's surprisingly rooted in our biology is just this desire to display competence. And I think, you know, this this applies a lot to parenting, at least for me. It's like I don't if I'm I want to be a competent parent, I want to show that I can effectively change the world. And if I do something for my kid, that's visible evidence that I'm being competent. And, you know, the reason that's biological is because people who can, or, or animals that can display competence are likely to have good genes and more likely to acquire a mate. And so this, the story I use in the book is bowerbirds. These are the, the male bowerbirds build ceremonial nests and then the female bowerbirds go around and look at the nests and decide who to mate with based on the, how much they like the nest and, uh, which all sounds normal, but then the female bowerbird goes and builds a, uh, well, normal, not normal in terms of how it should be, but normal in terms of how uh, kind of evolution works, right? And um, the good shelter would be a, a good way to pass down your genes. But then the female goes and builds the mate, builds the, the nest to raise the kids, right? So the whole point of this first nest is just to show that the male bowerbird can effectively interact with the world. So we all share that desire to show that we're, we're doing things. Um, and it even extends to, mm. to task completion. Um, and obviously like privileges adding, right? When you, when you add something, there's visible evidence that you added when you subtract something, it's like, it's, it's gone. Right. <laughs> and so there's not that visible evidence. And so that's a, a kind of some, two of the deep biological reasons why we might kind of think of adding first. Oh, I love that explanation because I think so many people, understand that when you explain it that way, but it's not something we immediately think about, you know, it's like when you were doing your experiments, people weren't, you know, making something better by taking it away until you said, Hey, you can subtract things as well. And then they were like, Oh, Oh yeah. You know, it's just not the go-to. Exactly. Yeah. It's not like we can't do it. So yeah. your podcast is doing a service to humanity by reminding people that, Hey, subtracting is an option. And that's like, uh, the experiments you're referring to are really, I mean, we, we'd, we'd simply say, Hey, you can add or subtract, remember, and you know, the reminder increased rates of subtracting, which you're like, Oh, of course, that's what reminders are supposed to do. But the reminder didn't increase rates of adding. So what that shows is that like people are already thinking of adding people weren't thinking of subtracting before the reminder. And so can you, you know, have a reminder like this podcast. And if you need a, a longer reminder, go read my book. Or if you, also, can you put in place reminders right now when you're thinking about it? It's like, okay, um, I, I listened to Liz. She said I need reminders to subtract. And so now I'm going to force myself when I do my to-do list to also think about stop doings. Or when I take on a new activity for my kid, um, I'm going to evaluate their current activities and be like, oh, maybe now that my seven-year-old is you know, playing soccer, I don't need to put his shoes on for him in the morning before school. Um, so 
those kind of reminders when you're making the decision can help ensure that you don't overlook this as a, as a way to make things better. I just think this is hitting on such a bigger level than you even realize because there's so (laughs) many of us out there, parents especially, but even just type A ultra performers who, who have that to do list, who have these things that they're adding on. And again, it's, it's that self-worth factor, you know, am I doing enough? Am I being enough? Am I a good person? Am I a good citizen? And if you're not like making the list chock full and, and checking it off, like you kind of feel less than, and I'm guilty of that too. Like I will make a list and then I'll, and I'll add things to it. And if I don't do it, then I'm like, Oh, you know, I'm useless and it's crazy. And so I think even just to hear you say that, it's just such a breath of fresh air. Like we need this. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I think, uh, at that comp, I'm, you know, I fit in all those categories too. I'm like, soup and, uh, but that like learning about competence and learning that of this desire that we have to display competence, uh, has really helped me thinking about, okay, these are things that I, this is something that I'm doing just to display competence, right? I'm going Mm. to this meeting that I'm not going to say anything in, or I don't have anything useful to say in just so that my coworkers see that I'm here and to display competence and I can get rid of that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's especially, and then, you know, when you throw kids into the mix and you're just busier than ever, like the only, you can't moor your way out of it. Yeah, you literally can. So what's the difference between (laughs) subtraction versus like essentialism or minimalism? Uh, There's certainly elements of essentialism in subtraction. And, uh, but I mean, subtraction is just this very specific action, right? And so minimalism Mm -hmm. is often the end state of, okay, I don't have a lot of stuff. And there's two ways to get to that. One is to just never have a lot of stuff, right? Never acquire it. Um, and the other way is to like, okay, you've accumulated a bunch of good stuff, whether it's, you know, I'm saying stuff, but it's not just physical things. It could be social interactions. It could be stuff that's on your calendar. It could be ideas that are in your head. So you've accumulated a bunch of good stuff and then you subtract to take away to get to something that's even better. Um, And so, I mean, the the simplest difference is that subtracting is the action that kind of helps you get to those places. But I also think that there's a version of those essentialism and minimalism where subtracting isn't required. It's just kind of this lazy form of less, not in a bad way. I mean, sometimes sometimes the way to less is just not to do anything. But subtracting is a very type A thing, right, because it requires you to do all this stuff and then keep doing it to... uh, well, keep taking away to get to a better end state that hopefully relieves some of these burdens that you were talking about. Yeah. What's your advice on, on, on prioritizing what really matters in a person's life? Because sometimes you feel like, well, everything's a priority and I couldn't possibly take away piano lessons because then my child will never get to Harvard. I mean, what do you like, how do you, as a parent, as a researcher, um, what would you suggest to people listening? Uh, I just go back to those priorities, right? It's so easy to not ask those hard questions about what are our priorities and what are our values. I mean, maybe your priority is to get your kid into Harvard and that's not super bad thing, I guess. And so then you can filter all your, like, is this helping my kid get into Harvard? But I doubt that that's anybody's core priority. I mean, the core priority is probably more along the lines of, hey, I want my kid to live a fulfilling life and I want them to have the same opportunities that I had. And so I think that there, well, in this, you know, there is even research that kind of supports this is that we add when we're just like kind of go along unthinkingly, um, like that's what our, our research showed that our default mode of, making things better is to add. And so if just the very act of thinking about your priorities, slowing down and and then kind of analyzing the stuff that you're doing in terms of, is this aligned with my priorities should reveal more, um, more subtractions. So I know that's uh, like, I, I didn't give people what their priorities should be, but I really think that like, just hey, (laughs) figure out what your priorities are. And that's going to be something that we often don't spend enough time doing. I 
This episode is brought to you by Sambacol. Sambacol Black Elderberry is the original black elderberry supplement. Black elderberry, if you didn't already know, has been used for centuries in traditional folk remedies and it's prized for its anti-inflammatory properties and high antioxidant content. I first came across black elderberry in Ireland and I fell in love with it there. As a busy mom, I cannot afford to be down for the count. I need to feel strong, healthy, and I want support for my immune system. And that's where Sambacol comes in. So Sambacol makes it super easy to feel your best all year round. If you are interested in trying them out for yourself and your family, head on over to SambacolUSA.com and be sure to use my code MOTHER15 to save 15% off your order. And if you need any recommendations on which products to choose, they're all great, but my personal favorite are the gummies. They're actually my kids' favorites too, so I just pop them in first thing in the morning uh, with the rest of my supplements and I'm good to go. Yeah. Was there anything that you had to eliminate from your life when you were researching and writing the book that normally would be on it and you couldn't question it, but like it was like a harder decision to pull it away? Um. Yeah, certainly. I'm trying to uh, think what the most interesting ones are. I mean, certainly a lot of these tasks, for me, tasks at work that I was doing that were marginally useful, um, but it just became impossible to do them and get this much more useful work done. And that was really hard because uh, for like a, a long lead item, like a book, I mean, now that there's a book and people in, you know, my colleagues see, okay, look, this had an impact in terms of sharing knowledge. Nobody's questioning it. But when you're spending three years on a project and it's like, why isn't Lighty at this, you know, committee meeting <laughs> and um, th- that, that kind of prioritization was hard for me, but absolutely vital in making this happen. Um, I think on the parenting, we've got a, our son is now seven. He features in the book. He's three in most of the book stories. And then uh, he's seven now, but now we have a daughter who's almost three. And just being able to evaluate the stuff that you're doing for your kids. And this maybe gets back to the, the priorities. It's like, you know, what is my goal here? My goal is a kid who can like be effective in the world and, and enjoy their, their life in the world. And, um, is me doing this thing for them really helping, uh, helping with that. And so that's another thing. And then the last one, the hardest one I think is to subtract ideas, right? Is to, here's this thing that I used, I believe, and the way we build our mental models is very similar to the way we build houses. I mean, some of the same language is used, right? It's called constructivism. And we basically take new ideas and jam them into our brains around the ideas that we've already got there. And which is, is fine, except for if you're building on ideas that aren't right in the first place. So, you know, periodically, like really, uh, questioning what you think. I know for me, like the, um, the murder of George Floyd and the stuff that came after that. It's like, I never thought there was a perfectly level playing field in America. I wasn't like that, but it certainly made me like rethink some of my ideas about everybody having the same shot. Also parenting has helped with that, right? When you see a five-year-old who doesn't have the same (laughs) parental, you know, situation that my kids have, you just realize it's like, this is their we need to do more to help the people who are being like kind of lost in the system. So, so yeah, subtracting, like ruthlessly prioritizing my time, um, really thinking about the benefit of the parenting things that I'm doing, which, and then the subtracting ideas are some of the ways that I've had to, had to do it over the, the past five years or so. I love that. I mean, what an education. I mean, you're working towards something. You finally have this finished product, but through that process, I mean, they always say it's about the journey, not the destination. I mean, wow, that was just incredible. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Uh, The journey is amazing. And getting to, to, like, I'm really surprised at this kind of after part of the journey. It's like you've got this book, and then this is amazing. Like, really smart people like you read it, and then I get to talk to them about it, and you get to hear what the what resonated. And um, so it's, yeah, it's really, you know, self-indulgent in a way. It's like I, I feel like I'm learning probably definitely more than anybody from this process. So. 
Oh, that's all. No, like that's why this is like my favorite job that I've ever had and like will ever have is because I get to, you know, talk to people like you and get to the core of these these big ideas that are going to be fundamentally changing the world. Like I know that like that's why I reached out to you. Um, But it did spark my like, what do you think we could subtract as a society for, I don't know, a more equal playing field for people or, you know, even just kids who are falling through the system like I know this is such a big question, but you're you're kind of on top of it right now. Like, what do you think we could subtract as a society to to help more? Uh, I mean, this is obvious, but like racism, right? It's like so much of the <laughs> oh, well, oh, just is, that, <laughs> just that. <laughs> but but no, but seriously, I mean, when you think about people care about this, right? They're like, oh, we need you know equal opportunity and justice, and then like the first thing is like, okay, how do we uh, hire more? Um, brown people in our organization. It's like, of course, do that. But also, like, what about the racist guy? <laughs> like, can we get rid of the racist guy? Um, or uh, And, you know, so I think, you know, Ibram Kendi's stuff has done a really good job of drawing attention to kind of, we need to be more proactive with getting rid of this bad thing. I don't, like, I'm trying to think of the, so that's the the racism one. <laughs> the, the level playing field, um, it's really interesting, at least where I am with the schools that, uh, to see the, it's not like a fight, but like this tension between like public and, and private schools. And so it's, it just seems nuts to me that we don't have public education that is good enough that every single parent would say, oh yeah, I'm sending my kids there. Right. If, if, if as a society we're saying like, oh, maybe I'm going to move my kid out of the public school in fifth grade, you're like that means you don't like the system's not working and it just strikes me as I don't know if that's a subtraction, but that on the, on the level playing field that just like really strikes me, um, as, and I, I worry because it seems like it's going in the direction of, Oh, everybody will just like pay for their kids to go to school and whoever has the most money will be able to pay for the, you know, the lowest student teacher ratios. And that's like exacerbating this problem. Do you have things that you think we could subtract on the to level the playing field? I mean, I worked in the government for like 10, 11 years. So any amount of bureaucracy that you can subtract, I think, is a healthy, a healthy move towards something, you know? <laughs> yeah. And my, my uh, friend, Bob Sutton, he wrote the no asshole rule. Um, he's, uh, he's a Stanford <laughs> <Yes>. professor. <laughs> So his next book is like about the friction and, and bureaucracies mm. and like how, you know, some amount of friction is good actually, but, um, I don't, I can't give away too much of it, but like, look for that. You should interview him. He's amazing. And I agree. Mm. I mean, I think, uh, obviously I'm not like anti-government and I think like that there's a lot of good that it does, but in every kind of organization, it's just, we, we do the same thing. We unthinkingly add and we don't question mm-hmm. the things that have been added. One of the stories I use in the book is the army. Uh, they did this really cool report on army officers and how they were spending their time. And the neat thing was like army officers get like, here's this task that has to take four hours. You have to spend four hours on it. So you can literally add up the number of hours they were required to spend on things. And it was more hours than they had in the, Mm. in the year. So, um, but so what you're forcing there, and I think I can certainly empathize with this is you're forcing them to cut corners, right? Mm -hmm. So here are these upstanding officers who've gotten where they are by doing exactly what's been asked of them to the best of their ability, super honest. And the only way they can do their job is to cut corners and cheat and say, okay, yeah, here's this four hour task. I'm going to spend two hours on it because I know I need more time on the other thing. And, uh, it just strikes me that so many organizations are now designed like that, right? I have way more stuff that I'm supposed to do than, than time to do it in. And so it's like one of the reasons I'm effective is because I'm good at cutting corners and that's kind of a shitty skill to, (laughs) to incentivize in people. Um, so yeah, cutting out some of the, the bureaucracy, I, I don't, maybe, um, some of the, I don't know, I don't, I'm not an economist, but it does seem like some of the wealth sharing between generations could be subtracted to, to help with some of these issues. I mean, it doesn't, it's, I, I, Maybe after I pass down money to my kids, <laughs> but, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> but it's, you know, when you think about that, it's like so. It's a lot of my decisions are uh, would be different if there was a bigger social safety net, and uh, I could um, know that my kids were going to be taken care of no matter yeah. what happened to me. Uh, so, 
Oh, totally. Totally. I mean, it's exciting to think about what could be. And I think that that's a big part of your book. I mean, it's it's presenting this thing of what could change in architecture, in, in the climate. You know, you're just you're so smart and so simple with the way you present things. I think it, it has to keep moving forward. What do you want the legacy of your book to be? What what change do you want it to make in the world? Uh, give people another way to that they can change the world um, and so, yeah, I want people like your listeners to have more of their options available for making change. And this is subtracting is this very basic option that we underuse. And I think, you know, if more people use it, the world will be a, an even better place. Yeah. Yeah. And for those listening who, who really are reticent to take away anything, what, what is the reason that they should do it? What implications happen if they don't do it? Uh, the same, it's just the same overwhelm, right? It's, uh, uh, I go back to the, the activities, right? But you're, you're not happy when you're just running from, from thing to thing and never have time to do a good job with anything. I mean, I think we all felt that, at least those, a lot of us felt that way when we were forced to kind of work and parent at the same time. You're like, this sucks. I'm doing my best at two things, but it's not good enough at either thing. And so if you don't, you know, okay, maybe we're through the worst of that situation, but it's the same thing in your, in your daily life. If you, it lives, if you, if you're unable to, to take things away, you're just in this constant state of, of overwhelm. And that's at the individual scale, but then, you know, move that up to the planetary scale and, you know, climate change is one issue or we literally have more CO2 in the atmosphere than scientists think is safe to have there. We need to subtract some of the CO2 and we're past some of these other planetary tipping points too, where the the problem is that we've just kind of added too much. And I know that's a very gross oversimplification of a very complex issue, but, um, this, this mindset that we can just build our way out of things isn't gonna fix these issues. I don't know if you've seen this stat. I I just came across it that the amount of human made stuff in the world is now exceeds the amount of biomass. So like the amount of stuff that we've built exceeds the amount of nature. And so we're like, uh, our actions are, are what's shaping, the the health of our our planet and that's you know to date that hasn't been we haven't done a really good job of that but it also is empowering in that like okay if our actions are shaping the health of the planet then it's in our hands to actually do something about it Mm, yes exactly exactly that is what i want to leave the listeners with today do you have any other final thoughts that really hit home the message of the book of of your of your legacy and what you want to leave with the world I would say like one more opportunity to turn people's attention to that the power of subtracting wrong ideas and the, one of the reasons I do it is cuz it's it's the hardest one and and I don't have any great tips of like here's the best way to definitely subtract wrong ideas but um that can be incredibly powerful if if you can do it and that's you know the path to to wisdom as Lao Tzu says. Yeah. Do you think self-awareness is a key component in that? Oh yeah. I mean, you can't do it without self-awareness, right? It, 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 and it also probably supports self-awareness, right? Because it, like when you're analyzing, Oh, what do I think? Or what do my actions reflect in terms of what I think? And it also gets back maybe to this, your, your great point about values and priorities, right? I mean, you thinking about what you think or what your mental models are gets right back to like what your priorities are. And, and that's how you can kind of filter things. I love it. I'm excited to see your work and where it goes in the world and what changes you make. I'll be following along um, as will the listener. La Lady, where can we get the book and find out more about you online? Um, anywhere the books are sold, you can get the book. Uh, so, And there's a Kindle version and an audiobook version if you like listening. Uh, and I have an easy Google name, so uh, Lighty Klotz, L-E-I-D-Y-K-L-O-T-Z, and you can find out the latest stuff. But honestly, the you know I'm on Twitter and uh, what's the other one? LinkedIn. The, but the best place is the, <laughs> the book. That's where all all my all my good stuff is. I haven't figured out how to write good things on Twitter yet. <laughs> oh, it's coming! It's coming, Lighty. It's thank- coming. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. 
Thank you, Liz. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed podcast. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast.